Hey everybody, it's Chris, and tonight I want to talk a little bit about what are boards, or school boards specifically, what are the characteristics that make a good member of a school board, and how do those pieces of information help inform our decision making as we participate as voters in a school board election. So first, what's a board? At its heart, a board is a governing body. And what that means is that organizations have a board that oversees the full operation of the organization itself. Schools can have boards, nonprofits can have boards, foundations can have boards, and for-profits can have corporate boards even. There are differences across all those boards, and I can say I've only participated as a board member on two of the four types of boards that I've just listed. Um, and so some of this is inferred based on what I've seen in the other board types. But there are three things that I think we can really hone in on as things that all boards do, regardless of type. So one is all boards are in charge of monitoring, evaluating, hiring, firing, supporting the top level executive for the organization. So in a school district, that's a superintendent. For a nonprofit, it's often an executive director. Uh, but the board holds the governing power around deciding who sits in that seat and providing that person support and feedback. Boards also always carry fiscal responsibility. The, re the budget may be developed and designed and contributed to by staff. The board has to vote to accept the budget. And the board, therefore, has responsibility for being able to interpret and understand and support changes in the budget to make sure that it can be fiscally sound. And then the last thing that I would say is like a common trend across all board types is that boards have a responsibility for setting and or upholding the mission and vision of the organization. And so often boards don't get to set because that already has been established. But even in those cases, it's the board's responsibility to monitor the current activities of the organization to ensure that they match that mission and vision. And we're not seeing what we call mission drift. So that's a little bit about boards in general. Now let's talk about school boards. What does a school board do? A school board specifically is held accountable for how the school and students within the school perform. Now that performance could be measured in a lot of different ways. We could talk about um, testing, we could talk about uh, outcomes after leaving the district. We can talk about outcomes in competitions, athletic or academic or otherwise. But fundamentally across all of those, the, the school board is accountable for really seeing that this district that they're governing is seeing the types of results that their constituents want to see for both the school and the student from a performance standpoint. Uh, within that, School boards definitely set the vision and the goals. They work to uphold the vision and the goals, ensure that policies are aligned with those. School boards do, in, a, in the school setting, have some responsibility for adopting local policy. They also have a responsibility for interpreting state and federal policies to determine how they're going to apply to the local context and to determine whether a local policy needs to be adopted or they can just implement the other policy that's been kind of passed down. They hire and evaluate a superintendent, they oversee the annual budget, and also school boards typically participate in the collective bargaining process for staff. And so while in some organizations, really you're only thinking about that top layer, in a school board, you're actually working with the union and participating in that bargaining process. So who makes up a school board? It's really important that school boards are diverse. And that, to me, that feels like a really important thing to talk about because when a board is elected in a general election, it can actually be kind of tricky because we want to look at the list of people and we feel, you know, encouraged or compelled to vote for the very strongest candidate. But the reality might be that our current school board is missing expertise in a specific area and another candidate would have been stronger. And so, you know, I think that it's so important to, to think about the diversity of talents and skills that a school board needs. And so we'll talk a little bit about some generic things that all board members should have. But I just would say, you know, when I think about what is the range of things, right, we need people with strong fiscal backgrounds, people who can really interpret those financial documents and help the other board members who do not work in finance to understand the decisions they're making when they're approving that budget. We need school board members that have an understanding of the city dynamics. So maybe somebody with a city planning background that understands how, what, what's going on when we're thinking about the bus routes and how those interplay with traffic patterns in the city. 
what's going on when we think about um, the patterns of attendance areas across the, the, the district or across a school. And so really being aware that that school board, we're, we're going to be drawing on a lot of different things. Now, as somebody who's been a teacher, it's really important to me that we have educators on our school board. But I also can recognize that if we had a school board full of educators, we may as well have just let the teachers govern themselves, which not to imply that that would be a bad thing. Teachers are very, very good school board members. But by definition, the training that teachers get, unless it's a second career, actually doesn't address a lot of those other pieces of expertise. And so when we're thinking about the school board, I think it's so important to think about the necessary diversity that will help the board to be as strong as possible. So thinking then more generally, what are the qualities that all trustees should have regardless of what dedicated or specific expertise they're bringing? Trustees should have clear vision. They should have a clear vision for, for the district, for why they're serving, for what their community wants and needs from them. That vision is really, really important. They should have clear communication and they should be able to communicate. I think, I think it's really important that they can communicate in both directions, that they are really good at sharing out with the community what's going on so that the community is aware of all of the things that are happening. They're also really good at hearing the community and they accept that communication back. Effective school board trustees are team players. <laughs> um, a lot of things that need to happen involve a, a school board coming together and and really leveraging the combined expertise. Again, that's why it's so important to have that diversity. That does mean that anybody on a school board needs to be really comfortable in a collaborative stance. They need to be really, really comfortable working with their, their, their peers, both in terms of the school leadership or the district leadership, but also the other school board members. School board members should really be able to understand what it means to have a fiscally sound budget. Um, not just that all the numbers added up, it's not just the math, it's really understanding um, whether my, my budget matches the policies that it needs to match, whether my budget is covering all of the activities that it needs to cover, whether, whether I've really, um, really matched up to our needed expenses, our income that's coming in. All of that can be really variable and good school board members have the capacity to think about the complexities of that and to support a really fiscally sound budget. School board members um, or trustees should be able to speak to how they are supporting the needs of all students in the district. Not some students, not just some populations, and not just pet projects, but really answering that question of how are all students having their needs met. And last but not least, uh, good trustees are advocates, and they're advocates within their community, but also beyond their community. Um, all of us are going to succeed together in the sphere of public education and when schools advocate out at the regional, the national, the state level, we're all able to better support each other, better come together for a larger goal of success outside of just our district goal, but also that advocacy allows us to really tap into the other resources out there that can benefit our district. And so I would say those are the six qualities that really, regardless of what unique expertise a school board member might be bringing, those six things are really essential for everybody to have. So thinking then about how to decide who to vote in this election. You have five people, you have two votes. <laughs> um, when I think about how I wanna vote, I definitely am thinking about that diversity. I'm, I'm going on to the website and I'm looking at who's already on the board. What is What are their backgrounds? Where might the missing pieces or the holes be in, in that constellation <laughs> of talent? Um, I also am really thinking about what the different candidates wrote in their statements. Now, in a typical election season, I might have tried to go to a meet and greet or engage personally with a candidate to get a better sense of that beyond what they they wrote and was published in the newspaper, given that we're sheltering in place. I've been relying a lot on those newspaper interviews to really think about both how do the individuals running match those six um the six skill sets, but then also what is their expertise and how does that fit into the puzzle? So why would you vote for me? There are a lot of things that we could talk about. I wanna talk about the six things we just went through. And I'll just preface by saying, 
the expertise that I bring is really deep expertise in the field of education. And you're going to hear that a little bit in how I talk about those six qualities, because you'll hear how those qualities play out from an education standpoint, which then, of course, is my expertise. So when it comes to a vision, I think it, uh, I was reflecting a little bit on this, and I definitely have a clear vision of what good teaching looks like, what a really strong district looks like. I've developed that vision through engaging and interacting with a wide variety of districts, um, both within Montana, outside of Montana, districts I've worked for, I've worked with. Um, and I think that that vision is really, really clear. But I think even more important than that, I know that in my work as a coach, when I'm supporting district superintendents, curriculum directors, building administrators, principals, or teachers, one of my skills is actually being able to work with the individuals to isolate what is the vision. Let's articulate where we're trying to go so that we can better keep ourselves aligned to that vision as we're making other decisions. As far as communication, I will tell you that my style as a leader is trends towards really transparent communication. I believe that every stakeholder should have access to all of the information that they need to understand the decisions being made. Not just to know what decision was made, but what, what, what were we considering? What was the vision that we were trying to hold to? And what, what were some of the key factors that prompted us to make that decision? As a leader, I don't ever believe in just telling people where we are. I want to tell them how we got there and where we're going to go next. I also believe that it is essential that transparent, that communication is not just transparent, but it's two way. And that any leader that cannot articulate for you, not just how they're sharing out, but what the feedback loop is for them to get back information about how what they shared was received or how people are feeling about the decisions is missing 50% of the communication. And so that's kind of the other tenant of communication that I hold is that transparency and what's going out and really open lines for things coming in. As far as being a team player, I when I when I onboard a new member to my team of people that I manage, I always tell them it's really important that you know that collaboration is my default stance. And that if if I have to go and work alone on a project, I'm actually going to produce something that's way worse. And that doesn't mean what I'm going to produce is bad. It's just so much better when I can sit down with a thought partner and whether we're taking something that they generated as a starting point and we're improving it or something I generated as a starting point and they're helping me improve it, that space of coming together and really benefiting each other, building each other up and working together towards a goal is something that is just foundational to my style. Um, fiscal responsibility, uh, you know, I, I am a career educator <laughs> And that doesn't mean I can't balance a budget. I've been on boards. I've, I've spent a lot of time working on balancing budgets and, and analyzing budgets and trying to find the holes or the errors in budgets. I will say of the six things, it's probably the one that makes me the most uncomfortable because I have never been trained in economics or fiscal management. I've learned this by doing, by engaging, and primarily by engaging as a board member um, in that space of looking at budgets. And so I do think that when it comes to the budget, the thing I do bring to the table is some pretty deep expertise in understanding education funding. I've been both the monitor of other people's uh, fund distribution on a grant, and I've been the recipient of monitoring when I'm implementing a grant. I've been the person needing to decide whether the thing we wanna do is in line with the state policy around the funding source that we're trying to use. I've also been on the other side of that at the state, really needing to have hard conversations with schools about whether they're using their funds in appropriate ways, given the policies and guidelines for the funds they're trying to use. And so I bring a lot of expertise in terms of maybe not always building out the finished budget, but really analyzing whether what we're trying to do in our budget is acceptable and allowable use of funds. In terms of meeting the needs of all learners, um, this is a little bit of a soapbox for me. Uh, when I work with teachers, we spend a lot of time in this space of asking the question of not just how did that play out for some kids, but how did that play out for all kids. It's really important to me that we're never ignoring a population. 
And we're never making excuses for why something we did wasn't quite the right fit for some people or some kids. I think it's just an important obligation that we have as leaders in education to make sure that we're never making shortcuts that hurt kids. That said, I always come into that space with a focus on combating deficit mindset. So if we think about this fun image of the kids on their boxes, I would say that a deficit mindset is when we say, man, it's really unfortunate that that one kid is short and we got to do something to help them because they're not going to be able to see the game or learn the content if we don't fix the problem that they have because they're short. That's deficit mindset. There's some truth to deficit mindset that because there's something, there's some barrier we need to find a way to remove, that there's like something that we need to do about it. What's not true about deficit mindset is that when we do that, the individuals who need our support, we're treating them as if there's something wrong with them. And there's not. The child in the purple shirt, it's not their fault they're short. They could be young. They could just be short. They might never grow any taller. But we shouldn't approach our solution to helping them see the field by framing it as a problem that they have. And instead, we should be looking at the opportunities. And so I like to think about this image and think instead of saying, man, such a pain, we had to go get those two boxes. And instead to say, oh my goodness, I am so glad we were able to find the boxes because this child is now able to teach us all about what's happening on the field. And when we come in with that mindset of asking, what can all of the students give back into our system? What are the ways in which we're all gonna benefit from each other? It actually becomes a lot easier to make sure I'm not ignoring any groups or populations. And it helps me to stay more growth mindset oriented around the capacity that all students might have. And last but not least, the advocacy. So. I've had the opportunity to be an advocate in a lot of spaces in my life. And I think my um, stance around what would be important for me as a, as a board member around advocacy is the opportunity that I have to have that two-way advocacy out to the national education community and then back into our district. Being able to hear what other schools are doing, what's going really well for them, not only helps us to bring solutions back into the district, but it also helps us to know what things we are doing really, really well so that we can advocate and share out the amazing things that our teachers and staff members are doing. It also helps us to know when the things that we're dealing with are part of a larger pro problem where we can join with other organizations to help solve the problem so that we're not alone. And so I think that while all of the board members might participate in advocacy, my role as an advocate would be in being a liaison out to the national education community and to some degree back to the state education community because I have a lot of connections and a large network in those two spaces. I really appreciate any consideration you give to the idea that I could be one of the two board members that you support, not just verbally or with a sign, but with your ballot in as you as you vote in this election. And so I really, I appreciate the time you've taken to watch this. I appreciate any support that you've given outside of just watching this video, but I also appreciate any willingness you have to really step back and ask the question of, of what's right for this district? What does this district need? And if the answer to that question is not that I'm the person you should vote for, I completely understand that. We all have different priorities. And the most important thing is that we are all making informed decisions when we get those ballots ready.